This episode of Blacktop Banter is brought to you by Craftco, the world's leading manufacturer of packaged pavement preservation materials and equipment for the asphalt industry. Learn more at craftco.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Blacktop Banter. We're on site, we're on location, we're remote this time. You've been getting that a lot lately between uh, all the summits and conferences we've been going to. This wonderful studio is room 303, just my hotel room <laughs> here at the Marriott. Uh, we're in Cranberry, which is a suburb of Pittsburgh. Uh, had a great time this week with uh, a lot of our friends. If you're watching, you see my friend Daniel Good here from Bay Country Contractors. And uh, man, we had, a, we had a good weekend. There was a lot of people come in. I mean, we got to see friends. I've seen a lot of new faces this time. There was. There was quite a few new people in the room. Yeah, which is fun. It's always it fun. They, they got that, uh, you know, for us, we're really comfortable around all of our friends and everybody. And I, I worry sometimes that we're too comfortable, that it makes them uncomfortable. Sure. You know what I'm saying? So I try to, like, fake being uncomfortable. <laughs> You know what I mean? I walk in like, I'm like, man, there's a lot of people in here. You know, while I'm standing by them, they're like, yeah, there is a lot of people in here. I I better start mingling with some of these people, find out who they are. You know what I mean? (laughs) But I'm not. But it, um, I'll tell you, like, you get in some of these rooms, like, especially like over the last couple of days where you start, I remember being that new face in the room. Mm -hmm. And, and I can remember quite honestly, those guys welcoming me years ago, like, I had been there forever, mm-hmm. so yeah. I, I I'm going to tell you that so myself specifically, and then like there's a handful of others that really try to be intentional, yeah, in welcoming those new faces in the room because I mean for real, if you're being completely transparent, they're scared to death. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's are. a room full of strangers that that look like they got their shit together. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what they don't know is we're all figured it out. Yeah. 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 All, we're just happy that people are in the shit with us. <laughs> this is all is all it is. It yeah. might look like we got it figured out. But any anyways, I want you to introduce yourself. I know people have seen us kind of being posts together and whatnot over the years, but real simple, uh give us an introduction of, of yourself, your your business. So, uh, uh, you mentioned Daniel Good. Um, yeah. I'm the uh, president of Bay Country Contractors. That's a civil construction company. Okay. We operate um, originally, um, the company was started in Southern Maryland. Okay. So, if you look at DC, a little south and a lot east of DC, kind of a peninsula down there, uh, represents like three or four counties. Okay. Um, Kind of uh, surrounded by the Potomac River, the Patuxent yeah. River, but it's really kind of nestled down in there. Really, um, you know, for a smaller size company, you know, my father and his partner started the company in the eighties. Okay, so a smaller size company, you know, that area worked. They did a lot of municipal work, um, water, sewer. They did some private site development work. Mm-hmm. Um, they did some site development work for themselves in in that area. Yeah, yeah, oh, in the okay. same area. You know, they'd go buy a piece of raw land. There was still raw land, and oh yeah, Maryland man, like the, the end Potomac? of the the end of the road, like where I live. I can remember. I mean, it was way back, but I can remember where it was just farm field. Get out. Yeah, like literally at the road, the end of the road where I live. Nothing but farm field, and like they ended up posting up a McDonald's on the corner, <laughs> and that was all she wrote after that. <laughs> yeah, then it just clicked. Yeah. Everything got there. Well, uh, was your family always from that area? So, yeah, my uh, my fa- so specifically, we live in St. Mary's County, which okay. is like the very tip of the peninsula of Southern Maryland. Um, my father father originally lived in Charles County, which is uh, the adjacent county, but they've always been from that area. From that so, area. Yeah. What did it, what did they do that got them into starting this business? They must have worked in that. So they did. So like my uh, my father was originally like he did some farming when he was in, in his young, much younger years, and then they got into the construction uh, business, well industry, um, working for others. Okay, working for others. You know, running equipment, running crews. Yep. Um, what's interesting is a couple of the state highways in the area where we live. Uh, my father's partner, Mr. St. Clair, back then, actually um, ran those jobs when those state highways were built. Get out. Yeah, like back in the late 70s, like he ran some of that work. Um, so they both had been in the business, different aspects, different huh. companies. And they came together 
uh, working for a small company, Austin Excavating, which was out of the same area, um, I think is where they met. Yep. And being from the same area, you know, back then you're, uh, you know, those guys are either working or they're in the bar drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, or they're working then in the bar. That's drink. right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, like, they had mutual friends, you know, a few mutual friends, so some acquaintances. They ended up working together. And, dude, they really, what started the organization was Gene had a bigger, Mr. St. Clair had a bigger family than my father's. Mm -hmm. And um, they were just looking for more. Yeah. I think our definition of more today and their definition of more, like, 40 years ago <laughs> was a little bit different. Probably. You know, I think Mr. St. Clair, he had, again, he had a large family. He was looking to... Uh, you know, more consistent revenue, what they thought, maybe higher revenue. Yeah, yeah it's a lot to support. When you it is. Your family. It, it really is. Yeah. And and I think my old man, you know, he had just gotten to where he wanted to try to work for himself. Yeah. Like he wanted to try. Wanted to be a little independent. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So they literally started out with, uh, man, I've heard this story. Of, I've never heard it, so you bring it. Really? <laughs> they started out, I, like I've literally heard it hundreds of times. Perfect. They started out with what they called a uh, what you, a thirty four fourteen international tractor with a blade. Well, it was like a, a tractor with a bucket attachment and a backhoe attachment. Oh my gosh! And they would dig water. Why not? They've been farming. They That's knew how to run those bad boys. <laughs> and they were uh, they were digging water and sewer connections for new for uh, new wow. houses. That's how they got into it. Yep, literally digging water and sewers from the street up to the house. Dang man, they do that when the weather was decent, and then um, what was that? What's that? Uh, Orangeburg? Were they using like Orangeburg pipe? Is that what that was called? You know what I'm talking about? Orangeburg. That must be from Wisconsin. Oh, I probably, I probably <laughs> I've never heard of that. It's like a, it's like a black fiber. Uh, maybe there's a different name for it, but it's like a black fiber pipe. We redid uh when I was on the village board where we live, like we redid a street in in sewer, right? And everyone was like, oh, we hit Orangeburg or. I think it's Orangeburg. Man, I don't know if that's what it's called. But they're like, they're like, oh, we hit it. And like, apparently the roots from trees can grow into it without breaking it and get across. That's why they roto rooter them out. I yeah. Guess. So we, um, like, around D.C., they call some of that, like, you've got clay sewer pipe. You've got terracotta sewer pipe. Yeah. I've never heard the term oh, Orangeburg. Right. We're going to look it up after the podcast. I don't want, not that I want to be right about yeah, it, right. but I don't want to be wrong in the future about uh, it. Yeah. Hopefully my days of down in the sewer manhole are passed. I've yeah. been there. Yeah. I've, I've seen the clay ones and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to, to think about how your dad and his partner did it, Versus how we do it now, it just it's it blows my mind because it makes me think about what is the next thirty years going to look like. How are we going to do it then? You know what I mean? I know. You know, I uh, like literally, like I said, they mentioned they started with a farm tractor and, and a backhoe attachment and a loader attachment. That's nuts. And when it wasn't, uh, when it when the weather was shitty, um, they split wood and for for money. <laughs> <laughs> they split. I you were gonna say for fun. No, <laughs> they, like they, drink some beer and split they, some wood. Well, it's funny is there's some stories of them splitting wood, um, under in like this old barn when yeah. the weather was bad. Yeah, and he told me that they went into it to do, they had split wood for like a couple of days, and uh, they went to deliver a cord of wood, and I forgot what he told me they got for it. You know, 150 bucks or something. Yeah. And the old truck they got delivering the quart of wood, they got it stuck. Oh, man. And he said that they had to call a tow truck to get the truck pulled out. Yeah. And literally, the tow truck cost them almost all of what they, they got. got for splitting wood for two days. And he said they took the rest of it, went to the bar and drank it up. Yeah, they needed to. <laughs> yeah, they needed to after that one. Man, that's crazy to think about. You know what it reminds me of, though? Like, uh, we talk about it sometimes. It, and, and it happened to me this year where something happens and you as a business owner are so invested that you'll just do whatever work has to get done to keep you moving forward. You know what I mean? Like this year we had some employees leave and who was next to get in line to go out in the field? This guy, right? And I spent the rest of the summer, a good two months, seal coating, line striping, crack filling, whatever, which at, at, at first glance, I'm like, dang, man, I can't believe I got to do this. But some really cool stuff happened. Eli come with this summer, and I watched that kid to get 
turn into a responsible young man while we were out there doing it made it a lot of fun but yeah thinking about that with your dad like like well there's nothing going we're gonna do something you know i uh you talk about you know losing men and having to go back in the field and you know our mutual friend jay duran you Mm -hmm. know him and i were having a conversation just yesterday morning and it was it had stemmed off of a podcast that i had done with our other friend, Kevin Gray, mm-hmm. and um, talking about the muck, mm-hmm. just life, the muck, getting stuck, something bad happens, and where, you know, a lot of people do, they stay there, they stay there, and they dwell in it, mm-hmm. and they lose their self, and, you know, it ends up being like an event in their life where something bad happens, and then they're stuck feeling yeah. sorry for themselves. And, yep. and they're stuck in that muck. And they, and they justify it. That is correct. That no. it's okay. Dude, that's right. right. And Jay and I were talking yesterday. And I said, you know, I said, I'm not looking for you to feel sorry for me. But if you go back and look at all the stories, these many stories in my life, and I had the opportunity to dwell in that place yeah. because of something that bad that had happened. Yeah. Stories with my mother, stories with my father, stories with business, mm-hmm. dumb shit I did because I didn't know any better. Yep. And I could have stayed in that place. Yeah. But then I realized if I, Mark, if I had stayed there, yep. the problems still exist yep. or the work is still there. Yep. You're just delaying getting it all yeah. done. Yeah. You, you, so I could stay in this place and feel sorry for myself or dwell over it. Yeah. Or just move through it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I've chosen dude, some of the stuff's hard. Man. It is hard. You, you, I mean, you want to move through it quickly and some of it you can't, you know, it, we, we have friends that, that aren't like in our industry or whatever that will come to that and us going through those types of things. Like I said, it's justified. And, and I'll tell them, yeah, that I don't blame you. You want to hang out and, drink and dwell on it and use it as an, and it's not really an excuse, but use it as the reason for the way you are. I agree with you. Yes, it is. Are you happy? Most of them are like, no. So then you can't do, then you can't hang out there. Granted, I give you justification and yes, you could. Yes, you can. But if you ain't happy, you're going to have to do something. Otherwise, how you are right now is going to be how you are for forever, for a prolonged period of time. And I got a quote hanging up. It's everywhere. Like uh, Kyla at my office, it's hanging in our office. And then at home in my bedroom, uh, Kelly sees it, right? It's everywhere. So I just print it off and put it everywhere. And it's really simple. It says, nobody's coming to save you. Get up. Right? And it's just like, there's times when it hit me when I could just, I justifiably could lay in my bed which is kind of weird that you can see it right here in the hotel room. <laughs> but I would, I could lay in my bed and it's okay. Like everybody would say, yeah, man, I get it. It That was a tough hit that you took. But no one's going to come and say, hey, get up here. And even if they do, I'm going to be in a state where I just fall back down. So then it makes me think, all right, the only way you're going to cure this is like you said, making a conscious decision of get up. Let's do it. Let's get through it. Let's push through it. Let's figure out a way strategically to get through here. And uh, yeah, I mean, it defines to me, I think every time you find a successful entrepreneur, and not even an entrepreneur, but just somebody who quote unquote is successful, you'll find that situations happen in their life when they justifiably could have just went to the bar for the next 20 years. Sure, absolutely. But they don't, right? And they trudge through it. I was talking about this with somebody at uh, the meetup yesterday, and uh, I said, yeah, I get it. You can hang out there. It's justifiable. You could drink for the next 20 years, do whatever you want to, but that ain't what you want. Otherwise, you wouldn't be complaining about it or using it as a reason right now. Right? You want You imagine what your life would be like if that didn't affect you. So let's figure out how to make it not affect you, right? And sometimes it's, to some people, they're like, you just got to let go. It's like, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's easy. Not, right? We got to figure this out. No, because I'm telling you, I don't need, you know, like real life, dude, is so hard. When you talk about kids and parents and health and crap that happens, it's outside of your control. Mm-hmm. 
but you have to just get through it. Yeah. Like you have, like I, this God, honest truth, man, when I was 26 years old, I was 26 when my father passed away. And I was already kind of running the business, which is an interesting story. But like the point I'm getting at, like at 26 years old, you know, arrogant me at 26 years old thought I knew. What I was oh, doing. man, you, you, man, you got it right. But, um, one thing I can say at 26 years old, I did is I took the week off in between when he passed away and when we buried him. Oh, yeah. And we buried him on a Saturday morning. Huh. And Monday morning, I went back to work. Yeah. Because nobody was coming to say, Yep. Yep. Dude, nobody you was had coming. to get up. Dude, we had to go. Yep. Because I, he had allowed me to buy a bunch of shit. Mm hmm. It's like we had payment books. You, you, you know what's funny telling that story is, I think about like my life during that time and the things that like left me in like fear, right? Were crazy obstacles to get over. Since then, the stuff I've had to make it through business wise and personal life wise since then is so much more astronomically difficult than the stuff that I was doing then. That that stuff, you know, when somebody comes, you know, somebody, one of my friends or somebody else comes up and tells me about this. I, I, you almost want to just start smiling. You're like, man, <laughs> this is nothing. Like you're, you're going to be fine, right? And, and get to it. When when uh, my employees left, ironically, you mentioned Jay. I re I recorded a podcast with him the day, the morning after my crew lead left. And I was telling him about it. And I said, I said, man, I said, you ain't going to believe it. I said, I'm going to have to go back into the field, I think. And so my crew lead left. He was drinking coffee. He said, congratulations. <laughs> I went, what? He said, congratulations. He's like, you're going to learn a lot, dude. He's like, you're going to be way better on the other side of this. Congratulations. Put down. I was like, this, that's you. That is completely Jay Duran. I'm trying to be like, be like, don't you understand my fears? And he's just like, congratulations. This is good. Yeah, this is good. You weren't Doug dwelling in the moment. <laughs> yeah. 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 He ain't having any of that. He ain't having any of that. We've had good conversations since then, but you know, what gives me confidence for you and I both have young sons. Um, sometimes I think that we, we've understood that when we were separate and didn't have a core group of, of peers around us, a circle of that, that we just felt like we were alone. Right. And you were like, man, it's, it's going to be bad. It's going to be whatever. But now we go through these experiences. We learn from them. We do help each other get through them. Sure. Um, what that done, has done on my end, at least has created a wealth of knowledge and wisdom for me about a lot of circumstances that happen in life. And here we have these young guys who owe me if I would have just stayed narrow and cowered up and like you said, stayed in the muck, I would have none of that knowledge. I would have none of that experience. And now I have somebody, a younger version of myself, looking at me for guidance. And if I would have stayed in the muck, I can't guide him through all the experiences in life if I haven't been able to either directly experience them myself or be around people who have that I'm able to gain insight from. I think that gives us a huge advantage. To be honest with you, being a dad is a scary thing. It is, dude. There's no instruction booklet. No. And, they, and times change. But just like in business, in some aspect, I'm not really scared about anything that's going to come business-wise. And I have that same confidence with our boys. Like, I don't think there's anything that they can run into. Granted, times are pretty weird right now. They are. <laughs> uh, that, that we ain't going to be able to tackle and I ain't going to be able to help them with. You know, it's like, Interesting. We talk about like raising children and not being concerned. You know, when I was younger, it's it was a thing. When I would act up, I'd get my ass beat. Yeah, it was just a thing. I mean, it yep. it wasn't everyday occurrence. No, but like when I would act up, I would get my ass beat. Yep. And you know, so it's thirty five years later, and now I've got you know. This little boy. Yep. And he's a cool. I'm not just saying it because he's mine. Because if he, he was a jerk, I'd tell you. <laughs> Dude, he's the coolest kid. Yeah. He gets on the phone and he mixes up with my buddies. 
from across the country. <laughs> like literally, my buddy Nate Swink, him and Nate text and call. Like him and Brian get on the phone and talk. And he's an amazing kid. Yep. And I've never beat his ass. Yeah. Yeah. I've never I, I'm not telling you that I don't believe in it, but I was I kind of made a deal with myself when I found out his mother was pregnant and this happened and the ch- baby got old enough and he started screwing up and I was like, I'm going to try to do this. Yeah. Like I'm really going to yeah. try to do this. Not that my father didn't do it right, but I'm, I made a deal with myself that I'm going to try to do this yeah. dad thing. And there's got to be a way to do it without whipping his ass. Yeah. And I can say there's, Dude, there's not a ton of things that I can sit here and tell you that I'm super proud of. But, dude, I can tell you that I've raised an amazing nine-year-old little boy, and I've never beat his ass. And he's a good kid. I'll tell you something about Eli. He's an asshole. He is 100% <laughs> an asshole. And, uh, but he's sweet, too. Right? He's lovable. But he's about like me. When he sees a window to to bust your balls or or to to roast you, he's going to do it, man. And he can't help himself, and he knows it. And then there'll be times when I'll look at him, and I'm like, you know what you need to do? And he'll relay it back to me. And I can see in his eyes when he goes to walk away and he looks over his shoulder, he's going to do it his way. And I know he's going to. I'm like, yep. Here we go. Me and him is going to dust up after this, right? And, not, and we'll do it. We'll, he'll do whatever. I'll come back, and, I'll, and he'll, he'll know he's waiting, right? I'm like, go ahead. I said, let me hear it. Well, you know, why did you choose to do it this way? And uh, he'll relay it and whatever. And there's been times when he was young when, uh, you know, I'd get fierce with him. And I never beat him or, or anything like that. I'd flick his ear or, or knock his head. Yeah, right. Like, boy, come on. Like we, we got to, this isn't the situation and I haven't had to do it. I did it a couple of times. I think here's the thing. I think I did such a good job loving him so strong that the disappointment, the, the, the disappointment I would have when they acted up and they could see it in my face and my voice was punishment enough. When I realized that I realized that's doing way more of a disciplinary action than me ever thumping him or flicking his ear or whatever. So, since then, they've always been very respectful. Kelly and I get compliments all the time about how respectful they are until he becomes your buddy. When he becomes your buddy, man, you got to be careful what you're wearing, what you say, how you dance, how your hair looks, everything, because he will bust your chops. And then when you give it back to him, he smiles from ear to ear. To him, that's you all loving each other, right, being close. But trust me. He's a, he's an asshole, and there's sometimes where to him he's friends with you sooner than they that person actually realizes that he's friends with you, and, and like he'll be like, they got mad, didn't they? And I was like, yeah, they got mad, dude. I was like, you told them their shirt looks stupid or whatever, you know. You had one. Who where were we? We were somewhere the other. We were we were at a hockey game, I think, and somebody was sitting in front of us. And we kind of chopped it up with him a little bit. Was talking about some of the players, and the, there had been some beers or whatever. Not Eli, at least not that I know of. And uh, <laughs> the guy was saying something about Eli's hair. He had curly hair till he cut it recently. And uh, I can't remember what it was. And the guy was sitting there, and Eli said, "I like your jacket." The man's like, "Wow, thank you, a black leather jacket." But it makes me sad. He's like, why? He's like, because he said that must have been a small seal because it barely fits you. Right, and the guy went, it, and it was up to here, right on the sleeves. And and you know, I just turned and looked at the hockey game, like nothing went on. I said, like, "Oh my god!" The guy looks back at me. I'm like, "That's his mother. That's my. That's his mother's boy." I don't know what to tell you with it, but yeah, he's he's a good kid. But I think that you and I are similar because, um, as I was explaining, most of the, like the joy, I really do try to look for joy quite a bit in the world and i i think joy is beyond happiness creates a different feeling in in your soul most of my joy comes from him and his sister right like dropping him off on a parking lot and seeing him stripe the whole thing himself and me come back an hour later and he's sitting on the curb you know 
Man, like, man, what took you so long? Man, that gives me crazy joy. Dude, that's awesome. It's nuts, man. It's a, a huge unforeseen blessing in my life that I just, it's something so simple, but it just, it gives me confidence that if something was to happen to me, sure. right, and he was 26, he's going to be fine, dude. And that's all because of whatever I've been able to kind of impress on him, right, or influence or just have him be in an atmosphere. That gives me confidence that I'm doing it right. It's kind of like when we, you and I would look at like our, our P&Ls and you see like a little bit of growth and you see some like, you're like, all right, I can relax a little bit. I'm doing it right. And I think that's like that confidence, like you, you know, knowing that Blake can interact with whoever, right, and hang out and loves being around us. Uh, it gives you a confidence like, all right, I think I know what I'm doing. I think I'm doing it right. Yeah, you know, uh, so he's playing football right now. Oh, yeah. And, uh, like, literally when they start playing football, they start practicing in, like, late July. Like, late July, early August is when they start the practice season. Yeah. And uh, we got closer to the game season. And game one, the coach chose, like, three three children for the team captains. Mm-hmm. The team captains to be out at the beginning of the game. They walk out there, do the coin toss, flip the coin, and after a couple games, coach took two of the three and pulled them out and said that they didn't deserve to be team captains, Mm -hmm. and that Blake would be the only team captain. Wow, he's the only one that demonstrated true leadership. Wow, man, and that that was a privilege. And that uh, Blake would be out there for the rest of the season by himself. Dang, man. How did that make you feel? It's so much of what we talk about is leadership. You know, we get in rooms. Last January, we were in a room with John Maxwell, and we listened to him for hours talk about leadership. Yeah. You know, my brother Brian Hess, you know, we talk like every discussion we talk about leadership. And that child has gone out there and become a leader of that team. And I can't explain to you the feeling. Like I literally jumped on the keys and started texting Brian. I was like, dude, you won't believe what your nephew did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uncle Brian rubbed right off on him. I, you know what it reminds me of? I think about this in, in that regard. It's really easy if, let's just say, our boys stepped up, they picked up a football, and they threw it 75 yards. You'd be like, whoa, dang, they got some talent, right? But then that's just a natural thing. Like they, they just be there. Now, with practice, they can improve on that. That's right. Right? Think about our two scenarios with the boys. Eli had to study. He had to work at it. And he's not great, right? He's not like the top level guys that we know. We know that. He's 12 years old. But he's demonstrated an understanding and a desire to hold himself in, on a craft to get good at it, especially for his age. And I think about that with Blake, right? Like being a, being a great leader isn't just – you're not born with it. Right. Well, and I've seen Jocko last week, which is mind boggling to me, right? That I'm about to tell you a story about me meeting Jocko. But he said that, right? Like, they're not good leaders, aren't born, they're made. And they're made through osmosis, which means other leaders have shown them how to be leaders, or they're made leaders through training, right? This is how you be a good leader, and they work at it. How crazy is the fact that your boy, being around good leaders, including yourself, has adapted the natural, the natural being of being a good leader that early on? He's got such an advantage, right? And it's not, it's not a natural-born talent. He's, he's had to hold himself and make mental choices to be a good leader and hold himself in that regard. That's something to be proud of, man. 
However, I look back when I was a child and I can't tell you that I did never had any success because I had success. I mean, and you know, several things that I did, but man, if like, really, like I'm not just throwing this out there, but if we only knew then what we know, oh, now, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, man, I'm super, super, super proud of that child. You know, Maybe, like you said, maybe it's the proximity. It's the proximity that he has or that we're exposing these children to. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, they're a product of the proximity yeah. of our network and what we're doing. Yeah, I think, uh, you, you, you know, we've heard that phrase a thousand times. If I only know then what I know now. What we're doing is teaching them what we know now, and it's the back then for them. Yes. So then my mind thinks, well, man, in 20 yeah. years, when we're set in our ways, which is going to happen, there's no way we're going to keep up with technology like this forever, right? The kids are going to adapt it more. If they can do what we've done for them by being in proximity, how much more are our grandchildren going to know? You know what I mean? So I think that that should be, just be a natural given thing. And it comes with teaching your children respect. And the, no one really says why you should respect people. Right. They just say, you know, show everybody respect, respect everybody. Well, I'm going to be flat out honest with you. Some people don't deserve respect. I agree right. Absolutely. Um, you should hold yourself in that regard and always put forth. I'm going to open to be respectful of this person. But if they're respectful. And they listen, they can learn a lot and it gives them a distinct advantage. And we focus so much with what our talk is on business right around all of our friends. But I focus probably more than what I should and more than, than all the people in our proximity on success, not around our, our bank account or our businesses. And to me, um, being a good person, I think both of our boys are trending in that direction. And to me, that's success, right? And for us to be able to um, impress that on them of this is also very important, right? Being a good leader, um, getting to know somebody really well, and then uh, being somebody that they can come to, right? Absolutely. So then you can come to them too at certain times. Uh, it's a it's a huge thing. I think it's 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 probably to me the largest part of a legacy. If you're going to talk about the impression you make while you're here, right? Um, I was I was, I don't know if we got anybody in our circle with this name, and I. I, ho I hate it if I do. I'm sorry. I don't mean you. But I see a lot of time people say like legacy construction, legacy builders, legacy whatever. And uh, it's always about, we're, you know, we're going to be the biggest, baddest and best. But then uh, I had a conversation with John Rugg yesterday and he was like, I want my legacy to be the lady that couldn't drive her car to see her mom because it wasn't dependable. Buys a new car so she can go see her mom all the time because she loves her and it's important to her and time is short. I wanted to be, I was able to create something so that two of my employees could get out of renting an apartment and have something they own and buy themselves a house. Uh, and John was just like, I just want to be the good person. I just want to be the good person. And John, uh, we were talking earlier about people in the room, you know, when they're like new and fresh. Yeah. I'm, all this morning, I was thinking about Tyler. I seen Tyler for a minute and really wanted to ask him. I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna, be, Big John's gonna be a granddad, right, and and whatnot. And I really wanted to talk to Tyler, and I I had two sentences, and then somebody said something and it distracted me, and I ain't seen Tyler since. Really? Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, I was laying here and I'm like, I'm an asshole. Like I know I am. Like Tyler probably was like, you know, I, he, probably not. He's a good guy. He's got a lot of other stuff going on, and I know it probably isn't on his radar, but. A different person outside of our circle probably would have been like, oh, I see where I rank. You know what I mean? Or it was crazy. It's like, really, if you look at Anthony Mann and his son, you look at John Rugg and Tyler. Man, if I had been in a room oh. of people like you and I. Yeah. At, you know what I'm saying? Where we are in our walk right now. Then mm -hmm. look out. Those boys. I know where their heart is initially because of where their heart is and where their intentions are. Yep. Being around 
us. Yeah. And it's all of us, not just you and I, it's the whole yep. circle. But mainly you and I. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, them boys are going to be unstoppable. Yeah. I watched Anthony Mann's son yesterday. Think about I, where their baseline is. Dude, that's what I'm saying. I watched Anthony Mann's son yesterday. I had, when I got done, I had to go in the other room and wipe my eye a little bit because, like, he challenged his father in the most respectful fashion possible. The child is still in high school. Mm -hmm. He's in high school. He's getting out half a day. He's riding the concrete trialing machine. And he challenged his father in a respectful, intelligent fashion because of something he picked up from you or from me or from, you know, one of the 45 other people that were mm -hmm. in the room. And I'm thinking, kid. Are and that's you... why his dad brought him. Yeah. That's like, the crazy part of it. And I'm thinking, like, this kid is re the real deal. Yeah. They're respectful and they thank you, Mr. Good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, he came up to me at the end and he's like, just wanted you to know I really enjoyed getting to know you and spending time with you. I had dinner with him. And, uh, we hear all this all the time, man. These kids don't want to work. These kids don't want to. It Bull isn't that at all. Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. That kid will do anything. Yeah. Because he's been grown. Yep. In a household and a group of entrepreneurs. Asphalt maintenance contractors. Winter's just around the corner, and we all know the harmful effects that colder months have on pavement. Here at Wiscoat, we've tried a lot of products. We keep coming back to Craftco because of their crack and joint sealers are the best in the industry. No matter the climate that you're located in, Craftco has products that will fit your needs. Find the full product lineup at craftco.com. That's C R A F C O.com. Have you seen the smoothness and compaction that Dynapack Seismic Technology has recently brought to the asphalt industry? It's incredible. And Dynapack's CC900G roller may just be the best roller on the market for driveway and parking lot paving contractors. It's even better than the little yellow one that you're used to seeing. But don't take my word for it. Give the CC900G a test run yourself by visiting Dynapack.com and finding a retailer near you. Say goodbye to potholes and roadway damage without the need for large crews, heavy equipment, or toxic chemicals. Aquafault is the only permanent repair material for asphalt and concrete that uses water. And installation is simple. Just pour, add water, and tamp. It's that easy. An Aquafault repair can be open to traffic immediately and fully sealed within 24 hours. Plus, the product is backed by a three-year warranty and is made in the USA. Visit Aquafault.com. That's A-Q-U-A-P-H-A-L-T dot com to learn more. I'm incredibly proud of the Blacktop Banner Edition seal coating unit produced in partnership with KM International and available now in both the 550 and 700 gallon versions. Custom built on the same frame as their bulletproof hot boxes, I work closely with KM to design what I believe is the best seal coating unit on the market. A unit designed by a contractor for contractors. See the entire walkthrough of the unit on Blacktop Banner's YouTube channel or visit kminternational.com to learn more and place your order. Since its inception, Dubuque Asphalt Maintenance has branded our trucks with the 1-800-BLACKTOP number from the 800 Paven Network and consistently seen increases in leads and jobs completed. I know the 800 Paven Network can do the same for your business. Visit 1-800-PAVEMENT.COM and get set up with your custom phone number today. Obviously, since you and I last got to hang out, I'm, I'm half the man I used to be in a good way. But that became from that came from Eli challenging me, right? Like, even if I and I still can wanted to put it on him, it's gonna get tough, and it's gonna be tougher and tougher. <laughs> yeah, and I was telling him that one day, like I said, he does. I tell him to do something, and he does it his own way. And uh, I said, if I have to do that, I said you're getting it. You know, did one of these to him, and he went, "You're gonna have to catch me first. And he and I was like, "Dang." All right. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you got to come home at some point, you know, like that was my comeback to him. But to be honest with you, like that was his challenge to me. He, he wants to go hike in the desert. He's like, I can't do that with you. I want you to play soccer with me. Yeah, you can't do that. He's like, I'm never going to have that. I'll never have that. This summer, we did an adults versus kids soccer game. And I ran from one end to the other. We, we go to the middle of this field. I'll tell you this story. <laughs> He's, he was waiting, right? I finally lost enough weight. I've been practicing. You know, I've been running, get my cardio up. We get to the middle of the field to meet. It's parents versus kids. And I walk up, shake his hand. 
I said, you ain't getting one effing goal. <laughs> we'll see about that. I said, I promise you ain't. I was nearly dead, but I would go down, take a shot, which I didn't score, but at least I got shot. I don't think I told him he was even going to. I said, I don't, you ain't even getting a shot at getting a goal. Buddy, I ran from one end to the other when I seen that they were going to pass it to him and must have been 10 times. I'd cut right in front of him. Boom, kick the ball out of the way. <laughs> That's all. And I was dying. I mean, <laughs> dying for me to follow through on it. We'd get close to we'd get close next to each other, and they was throwing the ball in or whatever. And man, I'd I'd just I'd rock it, right? Get him down to the ground the best I could. He'd get back up. Finally, we got done. I said, "Did you get what you wanted?" Yes and no. He said, "Right." He wanted to he wanted to rock it and just prove that he could do it. But then uh, last that great. Uh, was fantastic. I about died. My legs hurt for a week, right? But I told everybody for a week. I know he gets being an asshole from me because I told everybody for a week, I was like, played Eli in soccer. He didn't get one goal. <laughs> Every time Eli said that, they didn't even ask if we played soccer. They don't even care. I said, it ain't about them. It's about me. Yeah. But uh, last week, we trained this summer to, for run a 5K, which sounds ridiculous to people, right? But if you knew me before, I couldn't go five meters, let alone 5K. And uh, last month, we were in Louisville and ran a 5K. And uh, he beat me. I'll, I'll give him that. He beat me. Um, but when we were training, when we first started, where we are, it's in a, a like a subdivision. And the middle of the subdivision isn't developed. And there's a loop. Okay. So you can see each other when you're running. And we, we, we uh, measured it seven times around as a, as a 5K. So there'd be times where we started training. He beat me by two laps. And then when we got near the end, I could see him looking. And he'd look. And finally, like when we were ready to run the 5K, I'd be 60 feet behind him. And he'd keep kick, then boom, he'd take off because there was no way he was going to lose to me. And I got it now, like before we went to the 5K, I can almost catch him twice. I'd catch him by like the fourth lap and he'd kick and then he'd wear out and I'd come back again, run a steady pace. But we, we, we would time ourselves for our personal record. And what's crazy is he made me better by challenging me in that way. And because I'm open-minded enough and I, I love him enough, I took that challenge on and I, and it, it kind of, I had two revelations when we ran one. Um, I can do anything if I really focus on it. And if it means a lot to me and it did mean a lot to me, we planned this, I had to prepare and make my run, but we got into and I'm going to relay it to another story. Don't let me forget. <laughs> I, you're my guest, but I'm talking the most. It's all good. Dude. Okay. Uh, we get to this 5K. We get all excited. There's pictures and stuff. And we take off together. And it ain't very much longer. He goes, right? <clears throat> and it's in Louisville. You start on the Kentucky side. You run over a footbridge that goes to across the Ohio River. You turn around and the other, you run right across the same bridge, right? So we get going and we know our personal records. They're timing us. And I'm running with the slow dad mob, right? And Eli's running with the actual runners to yeah. start with. He's running with guys that, listen, they got short shorts on. They're wearing straight up running shoes with little tiny like muscle shirts. I'm like, these boys run, yeah, yeah. run. This is what they do. This is what <laughs> they do. Yeah. And uh, he takes off with them. And then. We, I get going up the bridge, and I see the guy that's wearing that thing is already coming back off the bridge. I'm like, yeah, he's probably – this was probably a warm-up, right, for him. <clears throat> but then we're coming across the bridge, and I see Eli running with a group of people. They're, and they're athletes, right? And he's running with them. He's struggling, but he's running with them. And I get across the bridge. I turn around. I go back, and Eli's waiting immediately. And should I know – Eli's talking to the guy that was wearing the shortest shorts you ever seen. And this, right? Eli immediately finds him at the end of the race, right? And asks him how often he runs, how he runs, what his training regimen is. All on his own, he asks him. I didn't say, hey, go talk to the winner, which is one thing for me to notice, right? That he goes to the best to seek the advice on how to improve. But then when I come and run across the finish line, I got looking, and my time was better than any time I put up at home when we were training. 
and Eli finished in front of me. I asked him, I was like, what was your time? He said, I beat my best by four minutes. And we get thinking on the way back. I said, why do you think that is? Tell me why you think when we were alone two days ago and ran, we couldn't run the best times we ever ran, right? I knew the answer already. I want him to think. And he's like, well, I don't try to keep up with you. I was already in front with you. He's like, but here, there was a group of people that I stuck with that were doing better than me, and I just wanted to keep up with them. I said, and by doing that, you beat 80% of the field. If it was me and you, your time would have been probably in the half of the field, if not less. So that's something to remember, right? Surround yourself with people who you know are doing better or striving to do better, and you're naturally going to do better. Right. Raise the bar. Raise the bar. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty intense. And it reminds me of John Rugg yesterday. He mentioned while we were in our, our podcast together, guys, something happens to me. Make sure Tyler stays here. Like he didn't say, teach him this, teach him that, do any of this. It was the awareness of just him being here is going to be enough to keep him in front where he should be that he's going to do better than probably the best of the world, the, the majority of the world in all aspects. It just gets me emotional thinking about John saying that because I, yeah, uh, I haven't lately, but for a while there, I was constantly adding another business to my portfolio. Been there. So <laughs> dumpster businesses and moving businesses and land development businesses and, I was adding all these businesses. Well, I seem to add businesses faster than I keep up with my legacy plan. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, it's it's been a year or so ago. Yeah. I went to Brian. I said, we were riding down the road in a car one day. I don't remember exactly where it was. I think we were in the car. I said, dude, I got to ask you something like for real. No, because we joke around and cut up. I said, I got to ask you something for real. He said, what's up? So, dude, right now, it's just, you know, Bay Country, it's just me. Uh -huh. I own a little over half the company, and my father's trust owns the other half, which is still owned by me. But basically, it's just me. Mm -hmm. And some of these other companies, it's me and this one and me and that one. But, like, all this stuff isn't outlined yet. And um, if something happens to me, I need you to come down here and get it straight. Do that for me, please. Yep. I, th I got this partner and this partner and this partner. And I know legally it's not set up for you to be the executor of anything. But I know that you'll always do the right thing. And I know that you won't let that little boy get taken advantage of. Yeah. And I know it's a big deal. But if anything were to happen to me between now and when I get it straight, please just get it straight to the best of your ability. And don't let him get it getting taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. and he said, I got you. The, the fact that we have a network and we have friends and we have people that we have established relationships with, but quite honestly, we met online. You and know, like, really? Yeah. You met on social media. Which used to be weird. Remember when people used to date and they'd be like, May I he met her online? And everyone would be like <laughs> Oh my God! You're telling me somebody from halfway across the country you let into your personal life? Yeah. <laughs> and now, now I'd rather do that than yeah. actually let people I know in here. And to be honest with you, Brian don't have nothing going on anyways. It ain't gonna bother right. you. No. <laughs> yeah, right. He's got plenty of time on his hands. Yeah, he's got plenty of time on his hands. But yeah, I think I think uh, I think that I think people on the outside looking in sometimes don't understand. I don't think they understand that the the business side of all of our relationships is so minimal. Like, oh, it is. you know, hey, set up a framework. You know who to hire, how to hire, what this is that. Get your account and switch your account and do whatever. Okay, sounds good. The most complicated shit in life is 90% of it, right? And that's the stuff where you need somebody talking about if something happens to me, right? Or my son trying to be a good leader, right? Or my son making sure he's in the right atmosphere so he makes good choice. You know what? You know what? When I leave the house every morning, 
and Eli's there. And if he's still there when I leave, sometimes we switch it up. He tells me, make good choices, Dad. Right? And it's like, you know, why? I get emotional thinking about that. I'm like, why, why, would, why would he do that? What has happened for him to do that? Right? When I'm, and I've said it to him, hey, make good choices. Right? It, it lets me know everybody wants to be heard. And it lets me know the person that I care about most, even if it's only him, hears me, right? And for me, I'm like, all right, I can go through life because at least one person hears me, right? Well, at least one person understands me. That's a pretty good baseline, and I would be cool with that. But I know that when we develop friendships, those friends also hear me. Sure. Right? And not, I don't necessarily need to be heard. But man, it sure does feel good, right? It's like, why would you fight against a get something that makes your life more full and brings you more joy? It, especially if you're just worried about what other people think about that. Sure. That makes no sense to me, right? It, it's 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 mind boggling to me. So, I think that conversations like these do a really good job of really showing what we have a hard time saying. Oh, right. Yeah. How many times, you know, we, we try to explain it. We always, we always say well, words can't describe it. No. I, and I was talking to Jay yesterday. I was like, how, how fallible is the English language? Like all we have are sounds that come out of our mouth. that's trying to express what's in here, what's going on in here. It's so archaic. I, was, I, I hope they do the neural link thing. So you can just feel what I feel. And I can send that over to you and be like, man, now I get it. You know what I mean? But I think that these conversations and stuff like this really help people understand that, yeah, you can do whatever, and yeah, it's cool and proud to do it on your own, and I didn't need anybody or do whatever. You know what, man? If that's if that's what you're proud of, you're literally going to be celebrating with nobody. If I don't need anybody, don't want anybody, you're literally going to be celebrating with nobody. Then what's the point of doing anything at all? Or nobody likes, I'll get to something when I tell you this, but nobody likes stuff any more than I do. Man, I like stuff. Yeah. I've I seen the Turbo. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I remember in 2006, <laughs> I had bought the girl I was dating, I bought her a Lincoln LS back oh, then. Yeah. It was clean. Dang. And we had just bought a house and bought a new SUV. And we were going to the Bahamas twice a year. Mm-hmm. And I just bought a bunch of equipment, ton off-road trucks and dozers and excavators. And, you know, you buy it because you got money in the bank and money's flowing and profits are high and you just start buying. 2006 was a long time ago, but like that's like I got started with the stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought psychologically, you know, I'm elevating because I'm able to get the stuff. Yep. So let me tell you, I don't know that people think about it like this, but when you start getting the stuff, personal stuff or things for the business, you and I are equipment guys and we support equipment guys. So I'm not sitting here telling you to never buy another thing again. <laughs> it's not where I'm going. But like, I, dude, I went out, I had four of everything. Yeah. And in every additional purchased put a weight on these shoulders that made you know when you have all this debt yeah with all this stuff yeah because you've arrived marvin you've arrived oh, you made it when you have the stuff yeah you made it so now you've got the stuff comes with five-year notes yep the burden is on your shoulders yep you look at the debt list. You look at the reoccurring monthly payments. You know, I've got $60,000, $70,000 in monthly depreciating asset payment and that burden. Well, I've got to have that next job. Yep. Well, man, I got all this stuff. I've got to have anybody that can run this dozer. I got to have it. Anybody. Anybody. Yep. Does it core values? Early I don't enough, care. Though, doesn't matter. Yep. Can you run the dozer? Yep. The burden of the debt, hiring anybody in the business, <clears throat> excuse me, taking any job at any price because 
We'll figure out how to make it work. Yeah. When I quit doing that shit. Yep. And got rid of the stuff. Yep. I mean, I still own stuff, but I own nothing like I used to. Own. Yeah. And I really started investing by taking my time because you put the debt on your shoulders, your mind goes to a different place. I can't even have this conversation. No. Because I can't. We're wasting really, time. Yeah, right. We're wasting time doing this. We are. Yeah. When, because when I got to figure money. out, like, how can I buy the next job? Isn't that something? I can't even have this conversation. No. I can't. I don't have the time to put myself in the rooms because I've got to figure out how can I pour myself out. Pretty much. Because I've got all you're, this you're stuff. slave to it. Got rid of the stuff. What did I get back? My life. Yeah. I can sit here. Yeah. On a Saturday morning, yep, and shoot the shit with you, yep, and actually enjoy it, yep, in this beautiful, luxurious podcast studio, room three hundred three. <laughs> yeah, I no, it, yeah, I know, man, I know, and I think that, I think that, that doesn't get taught. I'm telling you, I'm going to scream it from the top of this building for anybody that'll listen. It's to so me. stupid, man. Dude, get, I'm not again. I'm not sitting here telling you don't buy another thing again. Yeah, that's stupid. But you have got to be strategic on the things that you um, commit to as far as debt. Mm -hmm. Dude, you can pick up the phone tomorrow morning and rent just about anything. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, if you only need it for this amount of time, then you don't need to own it for this amount of time. Yeah. And you got to be smart because I'm telling you, when I got rid of the stuff and got rid of the debt, and was able to have these Saturday morning conversations. Man, my life, Blake's life, the knowledge, the shit that you're pouring into me this morning, getting in the room with John Rugg, being able to pour into the Anthony and his son. I mean, just the opportunities that I'm literally, I'm, I own half of a moving and storage business in Northern Virginia. I never moved a piece of furniture in my life. I don't know that I like anything any less than moving furniture and I own a moving in the storage business because when I got rid of the debt, I had the time to put myself in the room to have the conversations yeah. for a gentleman to be like, dude, I really like you. You're a good dude. I think, like, you want to do something? Mm -hmm. With that debt and whoring myself out on the street, and I could have never had this relationship capital. Yeah. Screw the stuff. It doesn't matter. The stuff doesn't matter. Yeah. This is what matters. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I consider me, myself to be very fortunate. Like I'm highly satisfied. Like from where I come from, my story, my upbringing, I hit probably the pinnacle of what, 25 year old Marvin thought his life would be at about 28. Really? Right. Like all of a sudden things just happened. And I, I, I never really could figure out why until it was put in perspective. Of this. Marvin, you're just a good person that we like to have around and be around. Right. And I started to like lean into that of like, there's probably a reason I'm this way. And there's there's also a reason why I'm not at every single TCS event, sure. but I'm also not at every single conference, sure. and I'm also not on every single job site that I, that we have and what we do. And there's days where I'll I'll look at the schedule and I'll be like, yeah, I ain't going to work, right? Like what you just said, the rest of the world would say that you, you got it wrong. You're supposed to work every single day possible and not have any type of a life until you're 63, 65. That's when you get to stop and enjoy it when you can't yeah. enjoy it anymore. Right. Can't move. I can't move. So we, we go to these ones. Right. And some of the f first things people say are like, you know, how many guys you got? What kind of numbers you do? Which we're very candid with our numbers. And I think that everybody should be. Um, and then they get to me. Right. And they're like, well, what, what, what were you at? What you doing? And I say, and they're like, oh, that's nice. But then they get to know me for a while, year, two years. And they're like, man, you get to go everywhere. Like, you yes. know, everybody. Yes. You get to do tons of cool stuff. I'm yes. like, yeah, I know. Well, I'm going to keep, you know, I'm going to keep going 
And then once I hit this number, I'm going to be able to do what you do. And it's like, no, it does, the number ain't going to matter. It's you being conscious of designing your business and your life so that it frees you up to live life. For me, Wiscoat is a tool. It's yeah, a tool right. that we hone in and creates margin so that I have leverage enough to come hang out with you and really enjoy my life, okay. right? Like it, that's what it's supposed, that's why you, if you haven't started your business or you have started your business, almost everybody goes into business for themselves so that they can have free time sure. to really enjoy their life. That's correct. The amount of people that really get to do it, that do that are really small because they figure out what you figured out. Thankfully, I didn't have to buy all the equipment and get completely burned down with it before I figured it out. What I figured out, and I can remember it plain as day, and people who listen to podcasts hear me tell the story a lot. I come home to Kelly one day after I'd made it, right? I told you, man, I made it at 25, 26. I think at, but somewhere at 25, I thought, man, if I could just be successful. At 26, 27, 28, I hit it. I come back one day, and she could just tell something was wrong. She was like, what is it? I was like, if all I do is go make black top black, paint lines on it, come back, and do that again. And I do that every day. Pay bills, go to sleep, eat dinner, go to sleep. And I do that every day for the rest of my life. I am going to be miserable. Like miserable if that's what I do every day. And she had no answer. She, 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 she was like, I thought maybe your feet hurt. Right. Like she, she was, she was like, <laughs> she wasn't expecting, but, and I had never said anything like that. I, that was the first time I thought deeply. I, I would say that I can remember. I really thought deeply and that started an, uh, an avalanche of me thinking deeply and, and searching, but it started this thing of me being friends with people who were very successful, but then also realizing that they said what you said, I, it, it, this makes me miserable. Yes, I can get anything and do whatever and make huge profits, but this is making me miserable. There has to be a better way. Yeah. Right? I realized that me and this little company, back then we were, well, I, I remember I called Brian when we first hit 100,000. I was like, I did it. Yeah, <laughs> baby. Yeah. And he's like, why did you say 200,000? You know, because I told him that I, my goal was 100,000. He said, you should have just two, you should have said 250,000. He's like, you you were shot beyond a hundred thousand. But what I knew was for the next five months over the winter, I could pay my bills and I could go wherever, do whatever, hang out with whoever. And I've been very fortunate enough to make genuine, true friends with people who, in my opinion, are very successful, live amazing lives with amazing connections. And I'm super fortunate enough to have not said enough dumb shit that they don't kick me out of the room <laughs> yet. <laughs> They actually want me to sure. be there, right? Uh, yeah, we're really, really fortunate in that. I think that when, when, when I see somebody, I know we both know guys that are well into eight figures that show up because they need to figure it out because they're at their wits end. Sure. Right? And literally, my first thing is, why don't you dial back, right? Get Let go of the four pieces of equipment. Let go of the $20 million goal that you got. How about we go down to $10 million, but it create 30% margin over 5% margin, and you spend time out of your schedule paying your employees for paid vacation so you get a vacation, so you can go on. I honed in on a conversation yesterday, and that's exactly what I said. I said, listen, like, really listen to me. You cannot be scared to back up. No way. That's the move. Yeah, so can, some people, that's the move. You cannot you, you, be, because you have become a slave to this. Yep. And now you're telling me you're owed all this money. You have all these payments. It's the same story. The, how many times have we heard somebody say, <coughs> Excuse me. it would have been better if I could just go back to me, myself, and a seal tank in the back of the truck. Yeah. Yep. They, they know that they were happier then. Sure. But they also know that they've trapped themselves. And they can't go back there. We have to take off of the stigma. And hopefully, you want to ask my numbers, I'll tell you. Hopefully, that helps remove the stigma of more money is more happiness or um, larger goals is more happiness. It's not. It, it has to work 
sweetly. That's correct. Right within it. You have to find the sweet spot. And then depending on what more you want to increase of, then you can make those adjustments. But find the sweet spot where you're happy first. Like, let's do that. You know, and I wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm sitting here and knocking large business because I aspire to do large Same. numbers. I do. I, I, do. I, I do too. To do large numbers. But yeah. what we will do is we will do it intelligently. Yeah. We won't do it by, oh, yeah, send me two of those dozers. Yeah. Destroying your mind, destroying yep. your heart, destroying your spirituality, all for the chase of something to measure up to something that I. I I'm sure you love your home. Yeah. At some point, somebody outside of your family is going to buy that home. And you, you, you ain't gonna be, no one's going to even remember. That it is correct. Like, these pieces of equipment ain't going to last forever. None of it is, right? The only thing that's going to matter is what you pass on to your son who passes on to his son. Or our great, great, great grandchildren go on Ancestry, click a leaf that has us on it, and it gives them pride long after we're gone of what we did here by being good people producing good things. To me, that's a sweet spot. Also, I will brag a little bit. We had about 30% growth this year at Wisco. Good right? for Which you, Which is dude. good, right? That's great. Yeah. And I still have my free time to come and hang out. Like, there was a time when I probably had that growth and had no time to do nothing, you know? Intelligently, I knew then, if all I do is go make black top black every day for the rest of my life, I'm going to be miserable. I have to make a change, right? Dial back, get smart, dial forward. Yeah, right. That's the key. Like, let's restructure, take away the stigma of working all the time, working your guts out, having no time for nothing else, no hobbies, no nothing is the way to do it. It's totally not. You're going to come to me at some point and I'm going to be able to see it on your face, hear it in your voice, see it on your child's face, whoever's face, that something is wrong. And what's wrong is, you ain't fin spending some time filling it up with the things that really make you happy. You know, we talk about like how cool these two boys are. You know, if I was doing now what I was doing then and I had that burden and I was selling myself, I'm going to tell you that the little fellow, the little cool little dude I've got now wouldn't be so cool. Bingo. You hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head. Kelly and I talk about this a lot and, Anybody who listens to podcasts knows that uh, her and I, we have, what happened was when I changed back then, Kelly stayed the same. She loved Marvin that did campfires and went fishing and did all that stuff. And uh, I, I'm not that guy anymore. I still enjoy him, just not every night. Yeah, you right. know what I mean? But Kelly, she's a country girl. She loves that stuff. So we've had issues and back and forth, but we love it. We still fight for it. We still go for <laughs> it and those types of things. But um you know, she's proud of who I am. I'm proud of who she is. It's just the crazy part is I know the same thing you know, that if I would let the things that could keep me in the muck, keep me in the muck, those kids ain't going to turn out the way that we hope they turn out. They're not going to be that. They're going to look somewhere else for the answers because they know that we don't have them, right? And that's what brings me to TCS. It ain't the fact that I know guys who do very well in business that can help me do well in business that create my revenue that make me here. It's not. We have guys that have strategically built their business in a way that they use it as a tool to enjoy their life, to educate themselves, to educate others, to educate their children, the people they care about, people close to them. And I think that that's the key. And what's crazy is we was talking about this yesterday in uh, the podcast we did at this big thing. I, I remember as a kid going to Euchre tournaments. You know what Euchre is? Euchre is a card game. It's kind of like a rummy version of, of a game. It's yeah, really I've, big in the Midwest. Right. But there you'd go to Euchre tournaments with the community at the VFW Hall, Community <laughs> Hall, wherever, and play cards with all these people. That'd be like 100 people in there. A lot of them old, too, and they get mad when you made the wrong move, these old dogs. They'd be like, oh, <clears throat> what you're doing? But... What you did when you were there, you would ask people about their family. They'd tell you yes or no, whether it was something good or bad. And you learned from their experiences how, what moves you should make in life, right? We stopped doing that. Everybody got on the internet. They don't have to be in person. Right. And everybody on the internet wants to be right. 
guys, right? True. They want to say, hey, dudes are shoes, not <laughs> flippers, right? Like they, that's what they do. And what's crazy is we've, we've found success in doing something that we always did all along. That is correct. Right? Like you, we used to do that. It's so ridiculous to think that, but it's been advantageous to us, man. We're able to have good conversations like this. And what's wild is Blacktop Banner started. I would have said, tell us about your business, Daniel. What kind of revenue do you do? How many sales guys do you got? Tell us about your equipment, sure. right? What does the future look like for Bay Country? Not that I don't give a shit about that <laughs> right now, but I really give a shit is how are you doing, yeah, right? right? And don't say good. Like, <laughs> say, tell me how you're doing. Hey, how you're really doing. Yeah, yeah, how you're really doing. Yeah. yeah. John Rugg made the mistake of asking Jay Duran, how he's doing yesterday. I said, Dude. Well, I'm getting out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you pull him up a chair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jay went for at least 10 minutes and he turns to John. He's like, Thanks for asking. <laughs> right? Gets up and leaves like, Dang, boy. So, no, I, if, if I could to, 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 to round it up and round it out here, what would you say you would say is one piece of advice? you think is crucial for somebody to be to have more joy in their life what do you think that would be business it doesn't have to be construction mm -hmm. but if you choose to be in business let's just take that vertical mm -hmm. you know this whole concept of peer groups peer groups and putting yourself in the rooms and business coaching you know business coaching, that's a slippery slope because mm -hmm. you really, you know, you and I have been around people that, you know, claim their claim to fame is they're this business coach uh -huh. and they've never built anything. Yeah. But put the coaching to a side for a second. I've got a good friend back in, at home that's got a uh, rather large HVAC company. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me several years ago that he had a peer group. And I was like, you know, what do you mean? What do they do? He said, well, it's, it's, it's other HVAC companies from all over the country. And we get together, you know, quarterly. And uh, we talk about best practices and what we're doing and how we're doing and family and life and faith. And we was like, really? He said, yeah, man, you got to get one. Like, you've got to get one because, like, my success, I contribute to like to that peer group because he said the guy down the street most of the time he won't share any of his yeah. knowledge. He said, but the guy across the country will. Yeah. I said, all right, and I started searching, and I went through a couple. I mean, I stuck my toes in the water at a couple places before I landed um, here, what I call home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't have to be lonely, dude. It doesn't have to be lonely. Mm -mm. Get yourself a group of like-minded individuals that you can spend time with. I, I say it all the time. It's like one of my lines now, but I find myself pushing away the guy down the street and bringing closer to guy on the other side of the country Yeah, because our values are aligned more. Yeah. But... You've got to get yourself in a room of like-minded people that genuinely want to help. Yeah. You know, whether it's your community or the TCS community, or there's other communities, you got to get yourself in a room of people that genuinely want to help. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not monetary motivated. They just want to help. Mm -hmm. Like when the Callaway left this morning, like, He's like a second father mm -hmm. to me. And that's happened in the last three years. Mm -hmm. Like when we part ways, it's like somebody turns the faucet on because like we mean that much to each other. They mean that much. Mm -hmm. And like you got to get yourself a group. You got to get yourself, you got to get yourself a group of peers. Of yeah. You got to find your people. Yeah. Don't try to do this alone. Yeah, let me share my experiences of mistakes in business, being a dad. I've never whipped his ass, but I had my ass whipped. Let me share that with you. 
because maybe it gives you a different perspective on what maybe you could do or try or what you're doing or that's really not working. Maybe I need to try that. Get you a crew, man. Like for real. Yeah. Yeah. I think to think about that, I think people also think that you either had to be all the way in or all the way out with everybody when you're in that group, like get that group of people to help after a while. You just want to be around them. Like there's nothing I can do really business wise to help Daniel. Right. But I do offer him sometimes and be like, man, you got to think about like the emotional effect of some of this stuff. Like you find a yin and yang with some people, sure, right? Man. And I want to go to Charlotte, not because it's going to teach me more about business, not because I'm going to get some great enlightenment, not because I'm going to party my ass off, which does happen once in a while when I go to Charlotte, but I go there because my friend's there who I love and I just want him to be by me. It ain't not, it's nothing more than that, right? And it don't have to be. You won't have that if you don't get in a room with people who genuinely have the prerequisite of they want to help you, right? You find people who want to help you because they care, right? Well, then that frees you up to care too, right? Once you get there. And I think like in our group, right, there's the people who are best friends. They've become best friends. Daniel Wright's my best friend. I'm going to be honest with everybody that's here in Pittsburgh. I don't like anybody as much as I like Daniel Wright, right? No matter who it is who's been here. I don't care who it is. But that's just because we connect, right? Dude, you know what's so special, dude? He's rigid as shit. Oh, he's, t- dude, he's tough. Dude, I it's like, ride, it's like, I mean. <laughs> he hates that shit. Are you going to ride a roll of sandpaper to Charlotte when you go to Because, <laughs> dude, he's rigid and rough, dude. I he's know. abrasive. I know, dude. And I say shit like. I say shit to him sometimes just because I know I do. I pull the Eli. I say shit to him sometimes just because I know he wants a smart, tactical, defined answer. And I don't give it to him. <laughs> I give him something philosoph- philosophical that has no, you can't go on Google and find it. It's something that I found out on my own by meditation, Daniel, but it's the right answer. And Daniel's just like, Ugh. you know, he's rigid. But at the same time, if I lived my whole life on a whim, hoping that the universe is going to deliver it, and I didn't have Daniel Wright saying, Marvin, no one's going to come save you. Get up. This is the next step. From there, you're on your own until you get plateaued. You need to know. He did it last night. He did it last night at the table, right, when we were leaving dinner. He did it to me last night. Today, I owe him one. So when when he's out somewhere doing whatever, I'll drop a little bit of knowledge that comes from the ether of the universe on his ears and let him know that sometimes the reason doesn't have to be a clear outcome reason. It can just be this and now to be good enough. And I really, really honestly, truthfully believe that my life would not be as joyful and I wouldn't have as much fulfillment if he wasn't as close to me as he is in it. Right now, I know I said he's my favorite, but everybody else is just below that. And then there's a lot of people way below that out in the world, right? Not necessarily in our group, but you ain't going to find that on the internet. You ain't going to find that without meeting somebody and really meeting them and being in a group of people that I don't want to say met the prerequisites. You're right. But the whole reason that they inquired, whether through BB or, or directly TCS or whatever about it is because they're looking for something. So you know that if they're even in the room, they've already pre-qualified themselves to be in the atmosphere of what we've created and been part of here. You know, I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but you know what's cool is, you know, you talk about Daniel Wright, you know. A year ago, Brian put, well, the board, the board put uh, Daniel and myself and two other gentlemen on a membership committee Mm -hmm. for top contractor school Mm -hmm. to be able to talk about and vet new members coming in the Mm -hmm. door. And you talk about argue (laughs) 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 because we all like, we literally see it's a long way to Richmond and we Uh, need to travel 95. Yeah. 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 And we're trying to, we all have the same goal. We want to grow the room, Mm -hmm. but how we're going to get there 
you know, Bill wants to go this way. And mm-hmm. Nate says, oh, take the detour. Daniel says, blow through the gates. Yeah. You know, and we got to check everyone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the point I'm getting at is, do we argue? But it's just because we're trying to make it and each other better. Yeah, I think one thing we've come to find out is we, we have a hard time describing what what it is that's magical about what we do sure. and what we have. But we also, we treat it like, and because it is, something highly cherished, right? And you don't just let anybody into your house. You don't just let anybody include your son. You don't just, the, the things that you care about most, you don't just let anything happen to it, right? I got my grandfather's 1965 Gibson Hummingbird. I love that guitar. I play guitar. It sounds beautiful. But I even know that I'm a klutz. And I'll and if I get in one, I'll I'll crank on that bad boy. And it's old as shit. You ain't supposed to do that. Right. It stays in a case because I know that case is velvet lined. It's got locks on it. So I might even forget the code. Right. So therefore it's safe because I'm an idiot. Like it's perfect, right? You do that with things that you care about. And even if it was somebody else's and they cared about it, they're going to argue with you <laughs> about how to care for it. But it all is because we care about it so much. That's right? correct. And literally, like we'd get arguing sometimes. And I, I'd ask Brian, I'd be like, dude, do you, do you not realize what you did here? Like, do we just argue about this stuff? It's because we care about it mm-hmm. and we want to make it better. And in the mm-hmm. process, we're making each other better. Mm-hmm. It's uh. It's been cool, man. It has been, been cool, cool, man. It's cool. It's a it's a cool journey, and uh, I, I think I feel like we always say we're just getting started with everything. You know what I mean, man? We're just getting started, but I, I think I don't even think it's that. I think that it's just not going to stop, right? Well, you know, I'm going to tell you. You know, if I think that's accurate, though, because that old Marvin. Or that old Daniel, how Marvin used to do business, or the guy that Marvin was, or the guy that Daniel was, where I had all the stuff. Yep. And I'd been in business 20 years with the stuff. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, 20 years in the construction business is like 40 at a normal job. I know. Sure, I need to be getting ready for retirement. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Dude, with this mindset change, and what are we, a physical change in everything we do? Yeah. Dude, we really are just getting started. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is different. Yeah, it is we're different. really just getting started here. Yeah, it's nice to be in. I, I wonder how often people can say they're in a room with people who are happy. Like, how how often can you be in a room filled with fifty people who are happy? Like, it's that's a rare thing nowadays. It is, and I'm I'm really lately been big. Which Brian called me a hippie, anyways, but I'm really <laughs> big on energy. And I walk up to Trey, just kind of wrap it up. And I think that's probably why you and I have connected really good on this podcast episode. I walked up to Trey and immediately do we, and it's like, you know why that happens? And then you know why I walk up to old Keith and give him a slow hug? It's because you're matching energy. With that's people, correct. That's right. right. You're matching their energy because that exists. They, and we're made of energy. It's supposed to go somewhere. Same thing if it's bad energy. That bad energy is going to attract bad energy, right? Agreed. And you're going to be there, be there. The quickest way to change your negative charge is to be around a lot of positive charges, That's right. right? It's the only way it's going to happen. And you match energy, start matching with people, and uh, you you f- soon find out that maybe you didn't even know yourself, and you find yourself, right? And then all of a sudden, you find more people who are like you or like Daniel Wright, completely not like you. That's right. <laughs> but you like him anyways, right? And, and that's that's negative attracting and the opposite's attracting it. But you have to get there. You have to get in front of people. You have to be able to open yourself up to have conversations sure. like this that let it in. So a lot of people, if if they hear this podcast and they're they're curious about what we got going on um, on both sides, right? Whether it's Blacktop Banner or, or TCS or whatever, um, they can find you online. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're on my head, Instagram, everywhere. Instagram, yeah. uh, my Facebook, 
Bay Country's on, uh, got social pages now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're there. LinkedIn? I, I am on LinkedIn. Dude, li- LinkedIn, I keep telling people they're sleeping on it. They shouldn't be. It's the next one. They are. I'm telling you, I need to figure out how to uh, make a nice professional post. That, dude, get out of my DMs trying to sell shit. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, if we could build a relationship. Yeah, I know. Dude, the rest takes care of itself. Dude, most of them, <laughs> most of them look like me, but you can't pronounce their names. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, that's another episode of Black Cop Banter. Uh, for myself and for Dan- Daniel, thank you so much for joining me, my friend. I appreciate you. Yeah. It's good to be to be here. I really, really appreciate you not thinking it was weird to come to my hotel room, but uh, you know, way we did get intimate, which is kind of <laughs> weird, I guess, in a strange way. <laughs> but for myself and for my friend Daniel Good, this is Black Top Banter, and we speak asphalt. Peace. Hey there, Blacktop Banner fans. This is Hayden. I am the co-founder of Spot On Sight. Uh, We're asphalt contractors ourselves. We run an asphalt paving company based out of Denver, Colorado. We know this is a game-changing app that will help you measure and mark your locations in your parking lots, document using time-stamped photos, videos, and comments, and send professional-looking reports to your customers. We have a free 14-day trial on spotonsightapp.com. Hey, Jessica Lombardo with Pavex, the pavement experience, and I want to invite you all to join us in San Antonio for the first ever event. It will be held January 30th through February 1st at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. We are going to have a live equipment demonstration over two days, 60 hours of educational programming, and a full trade show floor with over 75 manufacturers of equipment in the paving and pavement maintenance space. So, Please join us there and to learn more and get yourself registered, visit www.pavexshow.com. When it comes to asphalt tools and supplies, Liberty Supply has darn near everything you need. I actually think the owner, Sam, sleeps on a mountain of spray tips in their warehouse alongside the pour pots, hot pots, steel brooms, chalk lines, flagging tape, and hundreds of other items. If you call Sam today at 800-397-9907, or visit libertysupply.biz, they'll get you set up with everything you need. For custom and multi-piece stencils, I always turn to Stencil Plus. They've supplied every stencil we use, and these things last a long time. Actually, I should probably call Jeff over at Stencil Plus and just say hi, because it's been a long time since I've had to place an order. Anyway, if you want long-lasting, high-quality stencils, head over to stencilplus.com and save 10% by using code BB10 during checkout.